those are really great questions, and um, they're ones that I've thought about a lot. Um, first of all, uh, it's always useful to have context. Uh, I was hired as CEO, but I was really recruited to be Steve's partner. I didn't know anything about building computers. Uh, Steve didn't, at that age, know much about running companies. Uh, Apple had failed uh, with Lisa, it had failed with the Apple III. Uh, the Apple II was near end of life. Uh, the company needed cash flow in order to finance the development of the Macintosh, uh, which wasn't expected to be profitable for several years, even after it was launched. I came uh, a, a year before it was uh, ready for the market. And Steve focused on creating what Apple was going to be in the future. My job was uh, turn the Apple II around and get it generating as much cash as possible, which we did very successfully. The thing that led to the uh, huge disagreement, because uh, I'm always surprised that people never ask the question, how could two individuals like Steve Jobs and I, who were s supposedly inseparable, we were together all the time, we were great uh, personal friends, how could we end up in one of these amazing celebrated um, clashes? And it was pretty simple. I came from a world of um, public company accountability to a board, to shareholders. And when the Macintosh office, uh, which was the next version of the Mac that was introduced in 1985, uh, failed, uh, Steve went into a, a deep depression over it. Because uh, this was really important to him. And it really wasn't his fault. It was all about Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is a very predictable, consistent uh, law that says, that every roughly uh, 12 to 18 months, the number of transistors doubles, and therefore the performance uh, processing power of a computer doubles. And the reality was that the Macintosh office just was not powerful enough. It had nothing to do with Apple. It had to do with the stage of where a microprocessor technology was. It just couldn't do very much. And it was being called a toy. It was being ridiculed in the market. Uh, we did just introduced laser printing. Uh, to print beautiful fonts. It was slow. And Steve was discouraged. And so Steve uh, came to me and he said, <clears throat> uh, I want to drop the price <clears throat> of the Macintosh <clears throat> and I want to move the advertising, sh shift a large portion of it away from the Apple II over to the Mac. And I said, Steve, <clears throat> it's not going to make any difference. Uh, the reason the Mac is not selling has nothing to do with the price or with the Advertising, and if you do that, uh, we risk throwing the company in, into a loss. Um, and he just totally disagreed with me. And so I said, well, I'm going to go to the board. And he said, I don't believe you'll do it. And I said, watch me. And so we went to the board of directors. <clears throat> and we each presented our case. And the board met with us each individually. And then they assigned the vice chairman, third co-founder of Apple, Mike Markula, to go and study the question and talk to the various executives and engineers, and then come back, not to me, not to Steve, but come back to the board and give his report. And Mike Markla did that. And about uh, seven or eight days later, he came back to the, the board. He said, uh, I agree with John. I don't agree with Steve. And so the board uh, then brought Steve and me together. And they said, Steve, we want you to step down from running the Macintosh division, not get fired. You know, you're still chairman, you're still the largest shareholder, uh, but not, not get fired. Um, now, let's put it in hindsight, the other part of your question. What would have happened if we hadn't have uh, had that showdown? What I didn't appreciate at the time, I think I do now, is how emotional, how deeply set the values are of a founder who was on pursuit of a noble cause and absolutely believes, passionately believes, that they're going to change the world. And here is this professional executive coming in and thinking about, well, how are the shareholders going to react? How are the analysts going to react? Uh, what do we do as a public corporation? And I did not have the breadth of experience at that time um, to really appreciate uh, just how different uh, leadership is when you are shaping an industry, as Bill Gates did or Steve Jobs did, versus when you are a competitor 
in an industry, in a public company, uh, where you don't make mistakes because if you lose, you're out. So coming from a completely different world that I now understand, but I didn't at, at, at the time, uh, I really blame the board um, because I think the board understood Apple before I came. They understood Steve. Um, they knew what my experience was and what it wasn't. And I really believe there could have been a solution uh, to keep Steve and me working together because we were very good friends up until that, that point. Uh, and I had no interest to take over his company. In fact, I said to Steve, I said, hey, Steve, this is your company. It's not mine. You can have it back. But I'm not going to stand here as a public company CEO and um, have us make decisions like that without having the board involved. Just not going to do it. Uh, so my sense is that there could have been a different outcome. Uh, I feel most badly, though, uh, was after 10 years, I was at the company. And I wanted to go back to, the, to New York, where I was from. And why I didn't go to Steve Jobs and say, Steve, you know, let's figure out how you can come back and lead your company. I didn't do that. It was a terrible mistake on my part. I can't figure out why I didn't have the wisdom to do that, but, but I didn't. And uh, as life has it, um, um, shortly after that, I was fired because I refused to license the Macintosh technologies. I thought it would uh, drive Apple towards bankruptcy. Um, and so I had the experience of uh, learning about entrepreneurialism, about visionary founders, uh, and the great talents that Steve had, but he was not a great executive back in those early days. The great Steve Jobs that we know today is maybe the world's you know, uh, greatest CEO of certainly of, of, of our era. Um, he learned a lot in those years in the wilderness at Next and building Pixar into a great company. And when he came back to Apple, uh, he was obviously a, a very seasoned, um, you know, much more exper experienced executive. Uh, and I think that actually in the last 20 years, um, Ronnie said, uh, I'm uh, a professional executive. Actually, Ronnie, for 20 years, I haven't been a professional executive. Uh, I try to stay off the radar screen. Uh, but I actually own a number of companies. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I don't run any of them anymore, uh, but I mentor uh, talented CEOs. And I think that um, those lessons that I um, got along the way, going back to your questions, uh, are the ones that have shaped my life for the last 20 years. Well, that's a great question and a great response.